the language of the rubric is our common ground. And that language is in the hands of all the supervisors and in the hands of, of all the participants in the program as well. So they, you know, ideally are looking at, you know, the program that they just developed and presented and are saying, yeah, this rubric describes exactly what I'm sending in. We're looking good here, right, gang? Yes, we're yeah. right. If you'd right. introduce yourself mm -hmm. and uh, tell us what you do. Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I'm David Larson. I'm a, um, a training specialist in interpretation. Um, and I do lots of different kinds of projects. I pilot um, lots of uh, new um, uh, developmental opportunities in service, new courses, new curriculum pieces. But I also am involved in partnership a lot. I, um, the Fish and Wildlife, the National Conservation Training Center, pays part of my salary because they're interested in what the National Park Service is doing with um, the interpretive competencies, with the interpretive development program. So um, I'm actually kind of an ambassador carrying these kind of ideas and the, the standards of um, interpretation um, and our attempts to professionalize interpretation you know, out beyond just the National Park Service as well. Give, give us a good definition, a working definition of interpretation. Tough, um, and it's it's actually sort of been the problem. I, I can, but I'm, I'm going to give you this wrap of a back uh, of a. Um, I'm going to ramp up to it a little bit. Probably the problem with interpretation is is that everybody's got their own definition, and so I don't want my definition. I don't want you to think this is my definition. Um, this is a definition that's evolving, and that actually this program is suggesting is co is a common kind of definition for for the profession in general. It might be said that the problem with interpretation in the past has been. So we're like the Tower of Babel. There are too many interpretations of what interpretation is. Is it entertainment? Is it propaganda? Is it, uh, is it learning? Are we filling people's heads full of facts? There's parts of that in interpretation, you know, certainly. Um, interpreters have classically been kind of isolated from each other. Um, there are often parks in different places. Some managers get it. Some managers have their own vision of what interpretation should be and impose that. Interpreters... Uh, work very hard out in the field, they're very enthusiastic, care very much about interpretation, and, and if they, they develop a style and they develop a definition in one place, they, they hold on to that, and, and even when they do get together with other interpreters, they often will, will resist someone else's definitions that's, that's hard fought and hard won. So it's been a problem with the profession, is this, this fragmentation and, and this lack of a common professional language that articulates what we do. Okay. I would say that, that, that what's happening with the National Park Service is, is that we've we're coming to more of a common language with what interpretation is. And the line that sums it up the best is um, from a Japanese conservationist who died about 1913, Tanaka Shozo. Shozo says that the care of rivers is not a question of rivers, but is of the human heart. And I say that wraps it all up. And I say it wraps it all up because I think Shozo is using the word care two different ways. He says the care of rivers. Well, those of us in the stewardship profession, we get that. We understand that. That's the work we do. That's the, the physical, it's the resource management, it's the important stuff we do to try to protect these resources. The physical stuff, that's important. Shows us as the care of rivers is not a question of rivers. It's not a question of the physical stuff. It's of the human heart. So Shows us talked about care for the rivers, but then he's gone on to say, but it's of this human heart. And I think that that shows us using the word care in terms of care about the rivers. How do we ever come to care for the rivers? To support the work, the physical work of taking care of the tangible, unless we first care about it, unless, it, unless people, we as a public, decide that it's worth it, that we, that we value it, that it has meaning to us. What interpretation does, sometimes it educates people and sometimes it inspires people, but what interpretation is, what it's about, is raising those levels of care, providing audiences with experiences that have them go, ah, I care. I'm attached to this place. I'm connected. It's another important word. I'm connected to this place in some way that I wasn't before. That's what we do. We raise that level of care. Well, what's been your kind of epiphany and uh, experience uh, in interpretation as an interpreter with visitors? What, what is, where do you... Ooh. remember a, a high moment that encapsulates what you've described. Hmm. I'm not sure I'm exactly on point, but um, a 
I'll tell you about I think what I think is the best best interpretive moment of my life. Um, I was doing a program about Dangerfield Newby, an African American ex enslaved person who had marched with John Brown here to Harper's Ferry, and he was the first of John Brown's men who, in 1859, is um, is killed by the townspeople and the body's mutilated and it's a terrible thing. I was at a, a, a an African American um, museum association program and it. I tell the story pretty graphically, and I tell it from multiple perspectives, multiple points of view. Part of that story is also about the perspective and the fear of the white citizens of Harper's Ferry and, and their reactions. It stakes out a lot of kind of wide ground. I tell that story a lot. I've told that story a lot over the years, and it usually gets a good response, and the ego in me as an interpreter loves it when I get that kind of applause, but this day, in that moment, it was a little bit riskier somehow. It, did, it was an audience that I wasn't as familiar with, you know, it was primarily African American, I wasn't, there was an intensity in the room that was, uh, that was palpable, I mean, it was really there. And I finished the story, and there was no applause. And Bill Gwaltney began to then facilitate the reactions of the group. And it was actually beautiful. <laughs> because I didn't matter. The story took over. <laughs> the group reacted to Dangerfield knew me in those moments, and some were angry, and some were, uh, well, certainly everyone was angry, and some were, were um, just you know, wide gestures and big movements, and the conversation took its own place. Those people became engaged absolutely in the resource. And I was in a hotel room for crying out loud. I wasn't anywhere near Harper's Ferry, but they became engaged in the resource. At the end of, the pro the end of that talk, I actually show a photograph of Dangerfield Newby, and I call people to look into his eyes. Um, and I believe that for at least a lot of those people in that room, they'll never forget those eyes. That's the point. I, as the interpreter, the work fell away, and the connections are made between that audience and the, uh, and the resource. Now, some of my fellow interpreters were worried about me at that moment. They came up afterwards, and they said, oh, man, you know, David, that's a great story, and, and you just got to realize that, uh, uh, that maybe this crowd just, uh, uh, you know, w wasn't quite ready for it or something. And they, they were trying to soothe me because they were used to me getting this, this uh, big response, this applause, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, th I think the epiphany came to me, you know, at that moment that, no, this is actually maybe the best piece of work I've ever done because I disappeared. I, as the artist, I, as the, as the interpreter, quit being a part of it. There wasn't an appreciation for me. You know, in its purest sense, I was an interpreter who facilitated these connections between the audience and the meanings of that resource, and in this case, the, the eyes of Dangerfield Newby. So it goes beyond uh, just the storytelling. There's a connection that people have to have. It's not just following the storyline. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I'm, I'm certainly, I, I think interpretation has to be entertaining. I think interpretation um, um, utilizes, has to utilize accurate and you know, really accurate is the, the key thing, and current information. But those are kind of the tools. Um, you don't really have successful interpretation. I, the interpretive development program, this group of professionals now who are, pulling this together, we don't feel that you have, interpretation doesn't happen successfully, you don't have the outcome <laughs> that you're after in Gipper language until those connections are made, until the audience is, is emotionally connected in a, in, a, in a new or an enhanced way. Um, you can go, a visitor or an audience member can go back to a resource that they already know well. I mean, a lot of our audience members come um, specifically on pilgrimages, you know, they don't... Uh, they're coming because there's a meaning in the place that they want to touch, that they want to, you know, connect themselves, um, connect themselves to. Um, when you're interpreting to those folks, you know, the success isn't necessarily that you're giving them a new idea, uh, but you're helping to enhance, you know, maybe what's already within them. You're 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 uh, supporting them in some way, and you're you're deepening them. It is pro provocation to the degree that you're 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 carrying them further. Um, but it's not like, gee, you know, they've got to be able to answer ten more questions of a pretend essay or something to be successful. It, that's not what interpretation does. We're sort of the evangelists of the, uh, or the resource. We're the ones who say, hey, this is important. This is worth it. And the cool thing is, is that what we're really doing is telling an audience that's, that already knows it's important. <laughs> I mean, our work is 
um, our job, one of our jobs is to remind people why they decided these places were meaningful and important in the first place. So it's cool. I mean, you've got audiences coming to our places because, and reading about our places because there must be something special there. There must be something of meaning. And so all we've got to do is figure out the right way to help them connect to that meaning. I noticed you used <clears throat> my favorite word. Sorry? Mm -hmm. That's fine. I keep doing this. Uh, no, no, no. It sounds good. I was just mm -hmm. going on for a second. And you're cutting out. And we're going to cut. And we'll I use my favorite word, <clears throat> provocative. Mm -hmm. um, I hear that a lot. Tell us how it actually feels when you're working a crowd. I, I think we often forget that you, you are also... Uh, engage, engaged in kind of an energy content transfer that goes on there. And provocative is a word we use. It sounds like you you all get to know some buttons that that make us all think and give us some sense of place and uh, connection. Yeah, there, there's certainly um, there's certainly craft involved. It comes to practice and, and 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 knowing how to do you know how to go about go about things. Um, Provocation doesn't happen until relevance is established first. And that's one of the really key things with interpretation is, is um, the need to meet your audience where they are. You don't get to provoke until a, a, an audience member um, is touched somehow. You know, relevance is established first until they, their attention is got, <laughs> um, until you're speaking to them in some kind of respectful space acknowledging them as a, as a person with their own thoughts and their own thinking. Um, until that happens, you don't get a shot at provocation. And it's one of the hardest things about interpretation is knowing your audience. Um, and our whole educational backgrounds are about, you know, we've been made experts. We've been taught all of this stuff. And, you know, it's, a, it's something I think most interpreters go through in their career is this time period where they... Uh, they know everything, and, and the things that they know, well, of course, they're supposed to fill the heads up with the, the audience with as well. I mean, I certainly went through that in, in my career. My first couple of three summers were this magnificent time of learning, staying up all night and cramming more stuff in my head, learning more about my place, and then sharing it with people in the morning. But, you know, after four or five years, you know, I knew a lot of stuff. <laughs> and my hour-long programs as the summer would go on would turn into an hour and a half, and those seemingly enthusiastic visitors would, you know, start to back up a little bit and a little wide-eyed and, of course, they needed to know everything I knew and I'd bear down on them and work that much harder to make sure, you know, we, we joke and we call it inflicting interpretation. We in, I inflicted interpretation. It took a, a, um, a while for me and I think it takes a while for most successful interpreters to, to realize that it's really about meanings. It's about those connections. It's about provocation more than about filling their heads with all of this other stuff. And so, so my work is to establish that relevance. Who are you? What's potentially meaningful about this place to you? And then it's my job to know enough about this place and to know enough about you to offer a connection, to offer a way for those two things to come together. And the result of that is provocation. I, I, we're working on and we're learning more about how to learn about our audiences all the time, but that's one of our real cutting edge things. That's one of the things that we, especially in the world that um, is becoming ever more pluralistic and, 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 and the challenges to democracy grow ever greater. I mean, we really need to be able to understand our audiences and meet them where they are. Um, that has to happen before provocation occurs. Um, my personal thing, if I'd have an audience of, you know, say 50 or 60 people, there's always seven or eight of them in the crowd um, that automatically are giving you lots of um, good body language, good, you know, good um, facial expressions back to you, that, that sort of thing. It's a tempting thing to just give the program to them. And it's, you know, it's, it's obviously much more comfortable to talk to the people who like you and <laughs> who see the world the way you do. Um.